Sorry. This meeting is being recorded. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dietitian Zero Pro Healthcare. Um, and I know there's a lot of familiar names on today's uh, program. So welcome back. Hopefully we learn some new little nuggets or have some refreshers. Because I know that we get so much information about nutrition and food and, you know, what month is it and what food or superfood, all the, all the stuff, right? It's a bunch of noise. Um, so sometimes it's good to get back to basics. And so for this month being February as American uh, Heart Month, we are talking about heart health and specific nutrients that we want to maximize and minimize uh, to really make sure we're taking care of our ticker. Why is heart health so important? Um, it is the leading cause of death for both genders, men and women here in the United States. One in about every four deaths can be associated to some type of heart disease complication. Coronary heart disease uh, can lead to heart attack, angina, which is just basically pain, um, and over time, heart failure. Uh, high blood pressure is also a concern, one, because it's very common, and two, because a lot of people don't even know that they have high blood pressure. It is called the silent killer. There can be very few, if any, symptoms associated with this. So following up with the doctor and having our blood pressure checked on a regular basis allows us to kind of keep this in check. Why are these things harmful or a problem? Well, we think about, or I think about, our heart and our arteries. It's kind of a highway system, right? Everything flows through the blood. So whether it's blood sugars for energy, it's your white blood cells for immunity, your cholesterol lives in your bloodstream, your red blood cells live in your bloodstream so that we can move oxygen around the body. Well, if our heart and our arteries aren't strong and healthy, that highway system kind of gets some potholes, right? Now we've got traffic jams. We are slowing down. We don't have that good circulation. So whether that's high blood pressure that can cause the, the arteries to stiffen and become less flexible, right, in response to our needs, whether that's plaque formation or inflammation that causes uh, buildup within the artery walls. And so you can see the picture on the right hand side there. You know, this is where we start to get blockages and we're not getting oxygenated blood to these different organs and parts of our body. So we want to make sure that we are nourishing our body appropriately. So what are the four S's that we're going to go over today? Sugars, sodium, saturated fats, and soluble fiber. Sugars, sodium, and saturated fats, we are going to want to moderate and limit. And those soluble fibers, we are going to want to maximize. So let's dive right in. We're going to start with sugars. And sugar consumption in the United States is, is pretty high. So the average American consumes about 95 grams of added sugar per day, which adds up to about 77 pounds of added sugar every year. If we do the caloric math on that, that is almost 140,000 additional calories consumed from added sugars over the course of a year, right? And why is this a problem? Well, sugar is found everywhere, we know this. We really have two different kinds of sugars. We've got our naturally occurring sugars that are naturally occurring in food. So for example, fruits, we know that fruits are sweet, right? When you eat that banana or those grapes or kiwi or strawberries, they have a sweet taste, which means that they are a source of sugar. But those fruits also come with fiber, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, right? We see this with vegetables, whole grains, milk. Lactose that's in the milk is the milk sugar. So that's naturally occurring in, in your standard dairy milk. It hasn't been added by a food manufacturer. It was just there to begin with. So when we talk about sugar recommendations or kind of those that added sugar statistic, we are not referencing these naturally occurring sugars found in whole real foods. Added sugars are really the concern. These are additional calories and additional sugar that are added to our food products. You know, candies, sodas, cookies, pies, baked goods, um, you know, syrups, that type of stuff. And the problem with these is that they contribute a lot of energy, they contribute a lot of calories, but with no other real nutritional value, right? They don't come with potassium, they don't come with fiber, they don't come with the things that we would get from our naturally occurring sugar in, in our foods. Now, sugar can be listed as a whole host of names in a, a product. First, we can see that the top six that are listed all end in O-S-E, 
Anytime a word ends in O-S-E, it is an indication that this is a type of sugar. Now, honeys and syrups, corn syrups, molasses, fruit juice, agave, evaporated cane juice, these are all different types of sugar products that a food manufacturer may use in their recipe. Now, when you go and pick up an apple, right, it doesn't come with a nutrition facts label or an ingredient list because it doesn't have any added sugars. They're just naturally occurring within the fruit. But when we pick up, let's say, sweetened applesauce, or maybe it's some type of juice, well, they might be adding different sugars into that product. And those are the ones that we really want to be minimizing. Why is that? Well, like I had already mentioned, when we consume these added sugars, they're likely replacing other nutrient-dense foods. So for example, you wake up in the morning and you decide to have a donut for breakfast. Well, a donut's gonna have added sugars in it. If the alternative was that you were going to do avocado toast or oatmeal, but we chose the donut, well, that one meal, we now lost the opportunity to consume the nutrients from you know, that more well-balanced oatmeal dish, but we consumed the donut instead. And so this can minimize the ability to get all of the vitamins, the minerals, the fiber, the stuff that our body actually needs. Because I don't want to say we're wasting a meal, but we could potentially be wasting meals and snacks with these added sugar products. When we consume additional added sugars, it can contribute to weight gain. And we know that there is a, a correlation between excess body fat and increased risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of which can negatively impact our heart health. And we know that when we consume added sugars, and especially in the quantities that a standard American does, it can increase inflammation, triglycerides, and LDL cholesterol in the body. And when we think about the problem with inflammation, and LDL cholesterol specifically, is they really can increase that plaque formation inside of our, our heart and inside of our arteries and really start to slow down uh, the ability for that oxygenated blood to get through the system and do its thing. So what are the recommendations for added sugars? Depends on who you ask, right? But they're not too different from one another. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommends that we limit our added sugar intake to less than 10% of calories. Now, again, you might be getting sugars from a glass of, of skim milk or a banana, but the recommendations are for added sugars. So if you're consuming 1,500 calories a day, we would be looking for less than 150 calories from added sugar. Now, the American Heart Association does it a little differently based on gender, and so they recommend no more than about 100 calories of added sugar for women per day, and then 150 for men. So that would translate to about six teaspoons of sugar for a female and 10 for, for a man. Now, it, it's hard to sometimes quantify what you know that teaspoon equivalent is in a product, but if you're one that adds sugar, let's say to your coffee or tea, you, know, you could use those, those guidelines. Otherwise, most of us are pretty familiar with looking at calories on labels, and so that would be a, a, a different way to do it. All right, let's see, I just wanna make sure I'm getting all my, my notes and all the goodies. So, hidden sugars, where are they hidden? Well, the lowest hanging fruit is gonna be beverages, okay? Uh, for those that know me, I, I work in diabetes and I'm a diabetes specialist. And so I, I meet with folks in ways to help them manage their blood sugars. And I really encourage folks across the board, but especially if we're trying to manage our blood sugars, to watch the sugars that we drink, okay? Liquid sugars take no time at all to get into our bloodstream and start doing their thing, which is why if anybody's ever had a low blood sugar, they're told to drink juice or soda because that gets in to the system the fastest. Well, we don't want to get this big dump of blood sugars, this big dump of inflammation or, or sugar into our system. And so liquid sugars are gonna have the biggest impact. So whether this is your soda or pop, lemonade, sweet teas, or if you're adding, you know, honey, or you're adding sugar to your coffee or tea, certain alcoholic beverages are going to be a source of sugar, you know, your Starbucks coffee drinks, all of these things can contribute very significant amounts of sugar, okay? Um, cereals and granola bars, yogurt, peanut butter and jelly, obviously the jelly for peanut butter, you know, your, your standard run-of-the-mill peanut butters usually have some type of sugar added to sweeten it up and, and make it taste better to the consumer. Your natural peanut butters, you know, the stuff with the oil on top, 
is not going to have added sugars. I say reduced fat products as kind of an umbrella term because we know that food manufacturers can manipulate different ingredients to really impart the most flavor. And so the things that they usually can play with are salt, right? how much salt they put in something to make it taste good, how much fat they put in it to make it taste good, because fat tastes good, and how much sugar they put in it to make it taste good. And a lot of times we see that when a food manufacturer reduces the fat content of a product, they are likely going to increase the sugar and or the salt to offset that change and make the product taste good. So for example, reduced fat peanut butter. No, right? They're, they add additional carbs and sugars because they've taken away some of those really heart healthy fats. Anybody that's doing reduced fat peanut butter, I strongly encourage you to switch to natural peanut butter. Even though it's higher in fat, it's got good healthy fat. It doesn't have any of those added sugars. Ketchups, barbecue sauces, condiments in general can be a sneaky salt area spaghetti sauce, right? So like pasta sauce, um, we will see that they add sugar to these products to help offset the acidity uh, from the tomatoes. And so it does help to kind of balance out the flavor profile. If anybody's made tomato sauce at home, a lot of recipes will call for a, a little bit of added sugar in there to help offset, you know, that, that high acid from tomatoes. But your store-bought stuff can generally have a lot more than we would add at home. Certain salad dressings, you know, you think of honey mustard, French dressing, Catalina, these are ones that are going to be a little sneaky uh, sugar source, so we gotta make sure we check those labels. Sweet pickles, right? So sugar can really be in, in, in a lot of things, and so it's our job to make sure that we are checking those nutrition facts labels, which we will look at later today, so that we know where are those added sugars? Can I be choosing a product that has lower or no added sugars at all? And then alternatives to sugar. So this is a really common question I get, especially in the world of diabetes. You know, what are ways that we can sweeten our foods that aren't adding sugar? Well, we've got our, our category of non-nutritive sweeteners, which most of us would know as artificial sweeteners, aspartame, sucralose, stevia, equal, sweet and low, that, that whole kind of bucket. Know that the FDA does uh, categorize these non-nutritive sweeteners as generally recognized as safe to consume. I did want to call out that as of September of 2022, um, a pretty massive research study got released um, that looked at, and I've got my notes here, looked at um, more than 10 years of data of some French uh, citizens, and it was a pretty large cohort, they had over 100,000 participants participants. And um, over the course of these years, they were evaluating um, how much frequency and quantity of consumption of different artificial sweeteners. And this study released some pretty startling uh, conclusions. Um, and I have here, quote, aspartame intake was associated with increased risk of cerebrovascular events, and ACE K and sucralose were associated with increased coronary heart disease risk. So even though these non-nutritive sweeteners may not have sugar, carbs, calories, they are generally packaged with, with other processed foods, right? And they are ultimately processed and, and chemical-based options. And so when we put those things in our bodies, I, I think over time, we're going to start to see more of a relationship, which is why I put on this slide moderation, right? Um, it's not to say that we can't because they are generally recognized as safe currently. You know, how much are we having? So if we can dial back the quantity, we can minimize that risk. Now, sugar alcohols are different than artificial sweeteners. Sugar alcohols are a different type of compound, right? So if we looked at it underneath a microscope, the, the chemical structure of a sugar alcohol would look different and therefore is digested differently in the body. Sugar alcohols taste sweet to the human tongue but they are digested at a 50% or less rate, meaning that when we consume uh, 10 grams of sorbitol from let's say a sugar-free chocolate, well, the body's only gonna be able to absorb about five of those 10 grams. The other five grams are going to pass through the digestive system. You know you're looking at a sugar alcohol anytime the word ends in O-L. So just like our regular sugars end in O-S-E, if you ever see an ingredient on your ingredient list that ends in OL, it is containing some type of sugar alcohol. Erythritol, 
You'll see listed there first is unique from other sugar alcohols in that it is um, only digested at a, about a 10% rate. So if anybody is familiar with the product Swerve in your baked good aisle, um, it will say that it's you know zero net carbs and it doesn't have any, any impact on blood sugars because the product is made from erythritol. And so over 90% of erythritol is passed through uh, the body and, and doesn't impact uh, your blood sugars or, or caloric intake. And then monk fruit extract, uh, this is another common sugar alternative. Uh, you'll see this in a variety of forms in the grocery store. And basically what it is, is they take the monk fruit and they are able to extract a specific compound from that product or that produce um, that tastes sweet. It actually tastes about a hundred times sweeter than regular sugar to the to the human taste buds. And so you'll see this in different products that say zero calories, zero carbs, because this monk fruit extract that they extract from the product um, doesn't have any calories, and so therefore, you know, wouldn't impact uh, your carb intake, your sugar intake, because it's not considered that. But I do encourage folks to practice moderation across the board, not only because these are ultimately um, processed products, right? There, you, you don't just pick aspartame out of the ground. Uh, you got to make it, right? So it, it is processed product. The other thing I want you to keep in mind is that when we consume these really sweet foods, our taste buds kind of, they, they get desensitized. So they expect a higher threshold of flavor, right? So if we're drinking a lot of diet sodas and using a lot of Splenda and, and doing this day after day, meal after meal, well, when you go to eat a strawberry, well, because strawberries have so much less sugar and it's real sugar, right? It's a naturally occurring type. It's not any of these 100 times sweeter, 400 times sweeter. Our taste buds are like, well, that's not really sweet. That's kind of bland, right? We see this also with sodium and salt, right? When we eat a lot of salty foods, things that don't have as much salt taste bland to us. And that's because the taste buds on our tongue expect this level of, you know, this intensity or threshold of, of flavor. And so these things that fall beneath it just aren't as intense and so aren't really registered on the tongue. So please practice moderation with these really sweet products um, so that we can start to appreciate and gravitate more towards those naturally occurring sugars that we, you know, we find in fruit and get a lot of sweet satisfaction without having to rely on these more processed products. So moving on to sodium, what is the difference between sodium and salt? Because a lot of times uh, we will use these interchangeably and, and they're not. Sodium is an essential mineral that the human body requires. Now it only requires a couple hundred milligrams a day. We, we don't need a whole lot of sodium. Um, it's in charge of fluid regulation, right, throughout the body. It helps with nerve conduction. We need sodium for our muscles to work properly. So if we want to go for a walk, right, we need to have sodium in the body so that those, those muscles can contract and, and work properly. But where do we find sodium? Well, the reason we talk about sodium and salt is because salt is about 40% sodium mineral. The other 60% is, is chloride, which is why when we talk about salt, we say NaCl because Na is sodium and Cl is, is chloride. So what's the big deal with this? Well, when we consume too much sodium overall, right? A lot of times through salty products or processed products, our body is going to hold on to more water in an effort to dilute the sodium so that we don't have uh, a concentration problem. Well, by holding on to more water, it increases our blood volume. And now our heart and our arteries have to work harder to push this extra fluid throughout the whole body. And this can increase the force that's felt on the, the inside of our blood vessels, right? So high blood pressure. Now, not everybody is salt sensitive in the same way. There are some folks out there that can consume a higher quantity of sodium and not see the same impact on their blood pressure. But for the most part, we see a relationship between too much sodium intake, predominantly through salt or processed products, and increasing our blood pressure. And we know that the relationship between high blood pressure and increase for heart disease, they go hand in hand. So what are the recommendations? The American Heart Association recommends about 1,500 milligrams a day. The dietary guidelines a little more liberal, they go up to 2,300 milligrams. So as a general rule for somebody that's not on a, on a 
salt restriction, somewhere around 2,000 milligrams a day is, is very appropriate. Now, the average American consumes way above that, um, generally over 3,400 milligrams per day of sodium. And you can see that a single teaspoon of salt is, is really the, the max that we should be getting. Now, 70% of the sodium that we consume in the standard diet is going to come from processed and packaged foods, from restaurant foods, from things that are coming from outside the house. When we can put the salt shaker away at home and cook the majority of our foods and, and we're choosing these whole unprocessed foods, right? Uh, an avocado isn't going to provide us the same amount of sodium that store-bought guacamole is going to, right? But if we can make that guacamole at home with our own avocados, our own jalapeno, our own cilantro, our own lime juice, our own this, well, you get to control how much salt you're putting into that guac versus you go on and buy it, they're gonna put a lot more in because it's gonna make it taste good, right? So we do wanna make sure that we are, are staying on track with the amount that we are consuming. I also get a lot of questions about, well, isn't sea salt better? Well, sea salt doesn't have as much. Well, what's the difference between, you know, your standard kind of table salt, kosher salt, and, and sea salt? Well, sea salt is just an evaporation of seawater. And so these are generally going to be some larger crystals versus those teeny tiny white, highly processed table salt crystals. So if we do a tablespoon of table salt and a tablespoon of sea salt, well, if we're choosing a salt that just has larger crystals, there's gonna be more air, more space, between each one of those crystals. So as you can see, there, there might actually be less sodium per volume of, of two tablespoons, just based on the size and the shape of the actual crystal. Now, over time, I find that it, 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 it's kind of marginal, right? So we still need to make sure that we are limiting our salt shaker, making sure we're choosing lower salt varieties of, of canned goods or anything, because salt is salt is salt. And I also hear, well, sea salt's better for you. It's got other nutrients. When we talk about those other nutrients, whether it be magnesium or whatever, we are getting it in trace amounts, meaning very, very, very small amounts. So sure, get, uh, you know, purchase the sea salt if that's what you feel more comfortable with, but it's not a free for all because, oh, well, it's sea salt and it's less processed and it's better for me and it's got all these other nutrients. Those may be true, but those are true in basically like microscopic amounts, okay? So we still have to be mindful about it. Now, the DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. This is a widely researched and widely supported eating pattern that helps to manage hypertension. And there's a lot of overlap between the DASH diet and I find the Mediterranean diet, which is also a widely studied and widely accepted eating pattern to support overall cardiovascular or heart health. And so what do these diets really focus on? Fruits and vegetables, low fat or non-fat dairy, so we're minimizing saturated fats, which we're gonna talk about next. They focus on whole grains, right? We want those least processed varieties. Those whole grains are gonna have a higher fiber content. We're choosing lower fat proteins and for, in terms of like poultry and fish, right? Less saturated fat than our red meats. Uh, nuts, pistachios, walnuts, almonds, they really focus by eating those types of foods, we're getting higher potassium, higher calcium, higher magnesium, good quality proteins and fiber content that really help to manage high blood pressure. And a lot of those same principles you'll see in a Mediterranean eating pattern. What are the things that we're minimizing? We're minimizing overall fats by choosing these least processed, more kind of plant-based, is a very plant-based um, eating pattern, a little bit of poultry and fish, but otherwise we, we're looking at a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables, lots of whole grains and nuts, seeds. So by doing that, we're minimizing our saturated and trans fats, which we know are, are not great for the ticker. By choosing more of those plant-based foods, we're consuming less cholesterol. We're not incorporating red meats. We're not eating the highly processed sweets, treats, sugared beverages, by focusing on more of those whole foods, there's gonna be less sodium in our intake, so that's gonna to help to manage our blood pressure, right? So seeing a theme here of, well, let's eat real foods, let's eat these single ingredient foods, let's eat these less processed items, and it really puts us in the driver's seat to be taking care of our health, 
but we also get to make more decisions around what we eat versus allowing the food manufacturer to decide for us. So what are some strategies in reducing sodium? Anytime you're purchasing canned goods, always look for low sodium varieties. Okay, so we gotta check those labels, which again, we're gonna take a look at some nutrition labels at the end of this. So first start with low sodium options. And then whenever possible, really try to drain and rinse whatever is coming out of that can. So if you're getting canned, let's say vegetables, canned green beans, because it's affordable. Let's say you can't get to the grocery store very often. And so canned varieties uh, really allow you to kind of stretch between your, your grocery trips. That's totally fine. Let's look for the low sodium options. And then let's make sure that we take all that water, that fluid that the green beans are in, drain it out, and then go a step further and rinse those green beans, because that's going to be helpful helpful in lowering the sodium content even more, getting all of that salty fluid that those green beans were floating in and putting that down the drain. And now you've just got the bean itself. Now, of course, the green beans going to have absorbed some of the sodium content in the fluid. But if we start with those lower sodium options, it's now even lower by uh, draining and rinsing, making sure that we're looking at those nutrition labels, and if possible, looking at the ingredient list, because there's going to be <clears throat> some ingredients that aren't just listed as salt, right? They're going to put in MSG or if something includes soy sauce. These are things that contribute a lot of sodium. Now, I got uh, a lovely email before this because some of our participants had the foresight to already know their question. And so they reached out and I was able to get this answered for them. And the question was, what are some lower sodium alternatives to canned cream of soups? You know what I'm talking about, cream of mushroom, cream of chicken. Those generally have a very high sodium content, right? And those aren't things that you can drain and rinse because if you do that, you're just putting it down the drain and now you're not really left with anything. So what are the alternatives? Well, one, you can kind of make your own. Now I'm gonna preface this with what I'm about to describe still has some saturated fat in it, but could be a very low sodium option, assuming you're not adding any of your own salt. Basically what you would do is start by making a roux, right? So this is butter and flour in a pan, and then you slowly whisk in, while this is um, on, on your stovetop, a mix between, let's say, chicken broth and milk. Now, if you are going to be doing a cream of mushroom, you could do a veggie broth and milk, right? You don't have to do the chicken slowly whisk that in, get that all simmering and allow it to kind of cook down a little bit and it will thicken. And then you can add your own chicken chunks, your own herbs, your own spices, um, your own mushroom, right? If it's like cream of mushroom soup. Now, because that still includes the butter piece, there's a little saturated fat included. However, it's a very low sodium choice because, well, you're not adding any. The other thing to consider, depending on how we're using the cream of soup, is I really like to turn to uh, silken tofu. So this is a tofu comes in in generally six um, hardnesses or firmnesses. You've got very, very firm tofu that has a lot, most of the water taken out. And so these are things that we can kind of stir fry up and they, they keep their, their shape so that we can eat them as bites. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got silken tofu, which has a much higher water content. And when blended, right, so you throw it in a blender or a food processor, it will take on the texture of, let's say, like a, like a pudding or a yogurt. And so you could use that as the base, add in your own spices, your own flavors, your mushroom, your whatever, and, you know, add that to, let's say, a soup, right, to help kind of thicken it up. So it really depends on the, the application of your, your canned cream of soup. Hopefully that gave you a new idea or something to try. So hopefully that answered your question. All right, and then salt substitutes. So in the same way that we've got sugar substitutes or sugar alternatives, we also have salt substitutes. And we'll see a variety of these products out there. These are generally made with potassium chloride versus sodium chloride, right? So we know that standard salt is that NaCl, that sodium chloride. Well, interestingly enough, when they put potassium and chloride together, it actually kind of tastes a little bit like salt. And so these no salt products or salt substitute products will usually use that potassium chloride. It is incredibly important that prior to making this transition, 
You check with your doctor or your pharmacist regarding certain medications that you might be on, especially regarding kidney function and the high blood pressure medications. Um, the potassium component can kind of wreak a little bit of havoc. So you wanna make sure that you're not just doing a complete flip-flop and then you start to have some, some negative outcomes health-wise because that potassium is now uh, kind of interfering with the particular medication that you're on. I've included some salt-free seasoning blend ideas so that we can start to transition away from using salt as, as flavor in foods and using more herbs and spices. Now, in the same way that we had talked about sugar having kind of a, when we consume sweet things, the threshold for flavor is very high. Same thing for salt. So I encourage you, as much as you can, bite the bullet, two to three weeks, okay? And really try to remove a good bit of the salt in your diet, right? Trying not to do the processed goods, putting the salt shaker down at home, really, really focusing on this. Reason is your taste buds, they are cells and cells in the body are always regenerating, right? They're dying off, we're making new ones. Well, by giving it that two to three weeks, you're allowing fresh taste bud cells to come in. And so your threshold for flavor tolerance will come down as long as we are not um, introducing that lot of salt or a lot of sugar. And so I see this happen, folks commit to doing this two to three weeks, and then they go back and like get a Chinese meal or something and they say, I couldn't even finish it. Like it started to like hurt my tongue because the, the salt was so high or the sodium was so high, it started to like kind of bite back or is like burning my tongue. And they could experience that because these new fresh taste buds were like, what is this? I don't, I'm not used to this much salt all at one time. So anytime that we can transition to more herbs and spices, um, I'm seeing this more and more in our grocery stores. You know, you can make it yourself, but McCormick and Penzies and a lot of these companies are now offering salt-free seasoning blends that you can just buy right off the, the shelf for convenience so you don't have to make your own. And then um, if you did want additional information, recipes, the American Heart Association has a really awesome website lots of great resources regarding lower sodium um, options, how to cut it out, what foods to be looking for, um, and then lower sodium uh, recipe ideas. So I don't believe I had provided this to Ashley ahead of time. So when she sends out this email with all the goodies afterwards, it will include this, um, this pr presentation. And so you'll be able to gain access to this website. All right, moving on to our saturated fats. So fat, is not bad, okay? We gotta really get into the types of fat that we're consuming. Our body needs dietary fat. It is considered essential. It supplies the body with energy. It helps support cell growth and hormones. We need fat to absorb fat soluble vitamins. These are vitamins A, D, E, and K. And so when we consume those vitamins in food, um, or a supplement, it can help the body to also consume them in the presence of a dietary fat so that the body can actually absorb those nutrients through that fat, okay? Fat on the body, this is the, the stuff underneath our skin. Um, it's there to protect us, right? If we fall on our rear end, we wanna have a little cushion. Problem is, is when we carry too much, right? Now it's too much of a cushion or the types of fat that we carry on our body. So the subcutaneous fat, meaning the stuff that's right underneath of our skin, that's really there for protection. The fat that can get stuck around our midsection, we call this visceral fat. This is fat that kind of coats the organs themselves. That can be a lot more harmful to the body. And the brain is the fattiest organ in the body. Over 60% of your brain is made up of fat. So we need it, okay? Why does it get such a bad rap? Well, it's because it's so easy to overeat, all right? And what do we mean by that? Fat is considered a calorically dense nutrient, meaning we can fit a lot of calories, a lot of energy into a very small package. One tablespoon of peanut butter, is, which is a very high fat food, is equivalent to approximately 100 calories. That same 100 calories could be found in a medium banana, which is all carbs, or three ounces of albacore tuna, which is primarily protein, right? And so if we imagine a banana, three ounces of, of fish or a tablespoon of peanut butter, these are three different sizes, right? That are gonna kind of fill the plate, but they're providing us the same amount of caloric energy. So it's really easy to overdo it because 
I don't know about you, but I could eat four tablespoons of peanut butter in a sandwich. I'm not going to sit down and eat four bananas at one time. So we need to be mindful about our portions when it comes to higher fat foods and know that the body needs them. It just needs them in smaller quantities. And so when we look at that uh, calorie breakdown, fat, we are able to fit nine grams or nine calories per single gram. That's over double the amount of calories compared to carbs and protein. So we just need smaller amounts on the plate. A little bit goes a very long way. And when we talk about our heart health, knowing that we need fat, we want to make sure that we are consuming the right kinds. And so we really want to be minimizing our saturated fats and trans fats. Now, the good news is that we have seen a kind of a shift over the past several years that food manufacturers have been required to remove trans fat ingredients from their recipes. So we don't see them um, on the shelves like we used to. But saturated fats are really everywhere, okay? We generally find these in, in animal-based foods, whether that be chicken skin, highly marbled steaks, cheese, butter, whole milk, right? These are all animal-based foods. Um, They're going to provide us saturated fats versus our unsaturated fats. These are the ones we really want to capitalize on, considered mono and polyunsaturated fats. Generally speaking, these fats are going to come from more plant-based sources, avocados, olives, nuts, seeds, right? One exception is going to be fatty fish like salmon. This is obviously an animal, but it's a great source of omega-3 polyunsaturated fats. All right. We really want to make sure that we are minimizing those saturated while maximizing our unsaturated fats. And why is that? Well, we know that saturated fat has a tendency to increase those LDL or lousy cholesterol levels and triglycerides in the blood, in the blood just like sugars did, right? Very similar and as a result can increase our risk for heart disease, heart attack, or stroke. And so the recommendation is that we limit saturated fats to less than 7% of total daily calories. So if we did this math and you were consuming 2000 calories a day, that would equate to less than 13 grams of saturated fat for the entire day. Now, the beauty is that nutrition labels are required to have saturated fat as a line item. So you can find out which of the products you're purchasing that have a higher saturated fat content. Like I mentioned, they are primarily found in animal-based foods. Some plants do provide saturated fats, including palm, palm kernel oils, and then coconut oil. Unsaturated fats, where do we find these, right? How do we capitalize on these? Well, we they kind of do the opposite, right? So they help to reduce LDL cholesterol. They help to reduce inflammation in the body. And this is where we're going to focus on whole avocados, natural peanut butter, unsalted nuts, olive oil, olives, your walnuts, flaxseed, beans in general, broccoli. So those would be some more um, obscure things that we didn't know, like that's a source of polyunsaturated fat. It's definitely in smaller quantities than we would get from, let's say, avocado or walnuts, but the foods that are listed there are going to be higher quantities of unsaturated fats. And anytime we can purchase the least processed version, right? So you want to buy the whole avocado, you want to buy the peanut butter that's got the oil on top. And when you look at the ingredients, it says peanuts, period. We just want to get back to these single ingredient foods as much as possible because that's going to, again, put you in the driver's seat and minimize any of this additive stuff that we see food manufacturers putting in. So what are some tips? Well, we want to replace our solid fats with oils, meaning if you tend to put butter on the pan, well, let's put down a little bit of olive oil. And just as a, a, a little trick, if you didn't know this, you can saute, let's say vegetables, for example, in broth. So instead of using oil at all, if you wanted to reduce your fats or reduce your calories, is you can use like a low sodium veggie broth or chicken broth. Now, because it's um, more water-based, right, broth, it is gonna evaporate faster. So you're gonna wanna keep the container next to you and you're gonna have to continually use it as you're cooking up your vegetables, but you can use broth in place of a fat. We wanna replace our processed snacks with whole food, food items. So those unsalted nuts, your fresh fruits, your fresh vegetables, non-fat yogurt, Processed snacks being things like your crackers, your cookies, your chips, your, 
the stuff that's going to come with more of the, the, the additives, right? We want to get back to those single ingredient foods. We want to replace our red meats with more of those lower saturated fat or just lower fat options. Beans, soy, and tofu are going to be great plant-based alternatives to higher fat animal products. Um, fish like your sardines or your salmon or your halibut, these are going to be um, have some fat in them, but they're going to be those, those better for you fats. Now you'll see the word replace on here, okay? This isn't about removing all fats, and this isn't about just adding the healthier fats and keeping the not so great ones. We really want to see a shift. Now, I will put a caveat on this since I, I think we're all probably living in Wisconsin right now. If, if everybody's you know signed in from Wisconsin, I'm never going to tell people you can't eat cheese, right? We are the dairy state and you're going to eat cheese. Cheese is a source of saturated fat. Do so in moderation. Choose the highest quality cheese, right? But not the processed stuff. And if you choose cheese that has a stronger flavor, so we think of Parmesan instead of mozzarella, right? That Parmesan is just a much stronger cheese flavor. You can generally use less of it so that you get your cheese benefit, but you don't have to consume as many saturated fats to do so. Now, moving on to soluble, soluble fibers, last but not least. What is soluble fiber? Well, fiber in general is generally comes in two categories. We've got insoluble and soluble. Insoluble fiber makes up, it's, it's kind of like the broom for the colon, right? Helps to push things through. It helps to keep us moving, if you know what I mean. Helps to kind of just like broom through, clean it up. Soluble fiber is different in that it actually turns into a gel-like compound or uh, jelly inside of the digestive tract. And so things get kind of trapped in that soluble fiber gel. And this is one of the ways that we can make the claim that soluble fiber helps to reduce cholesterol. Because what happens is cholesterol compounds get kind of trapped in that soluble fiber gel. And as that moves through and, and comes out the other end, we did not reabsorb those cholesterol compounds, therefore lowering your overall cholesterol numbers. And so by eating high fiber foods in general, you're going to get both insoluble and soluble fibers. Um, and I'm going to give you some references today about which foods have, have higher soluble fiber amounts. But we generally want to increase fiber overall. Not only can this help with the cholesterol piece, but it's also going to help to potentially reduce blood pressure and definitely that inflammation. So what are the recommendations? Keep in mind that the average American currently consumes about or less than 15 grams of dietary fiber a day. We can see here that we're looking at much more than that, okay? And these, are, I really encourage you to think of as minimums. As you increase your fiber intake, uh, a lot of times people kind of, uh, they shy away from it a little bit because of the inevitable GI changes, right? Um, Fiber can increase our gas, can help, can make us feel a little more bloated, um, can change our, our frequency in the bathroom, right? And some people are like, man, I don't want to deal with all that. Well, the best way to mitigate all of that is that you're going to increase your fiber slowly, okay? So I generally say, try to aim for adding an extra three to five grams of fiber this next week, right? How can you add one extra serving of something per day so that we're increasing by three or five grams a day? And as you do that, you have to make sure you also increase your water intake. If we increase fiber without enough hydration, everything kind of gets stuck, okay? We need that water to help keep things flowing. So we're increasing fiber in small quantities and we're increasing our fiber intake at the same time. Now, in terms of the ratio between insoluble and soluble, uh, it's, we recommend three to one meaning that we want three times the amount of insoluble with soluble. So if you were going to consume 32 grams of fiber today, 24 of that would come from insoluble, eight of that would come from soluble fiber. Now, how do we do that? Well, if we take a look at a list of foods that are very high in soluble fiber, it's incredibly doable, right? So if I think about breakfast, well, if I could do avocado toast with a side of apricots or apple or something, right? Maybe I sprinkle a little bit of flax seed or sunflower seeds on top of that avocado. Well, boom, I'm at three to four grams of soluble fiber from breakfast. And now at lunch, if I add a serving of, let's say, black beans, or I'm going to add a tablespoon of ground flax into my salad dressing, 
Okay, well there, I just added another, let's depending on the serving, another three to five grams of soluble fiber. Boom, I'm done. I don't even need to worry about dinner, but wait, if I did roasted vegetables, carrots, Brussels sprouts, sweet potatoes, okay, I'm adding additional soluble fiber. If I wanna make a stir fry, right? I'm gonna put carrot sticks and br Brussels sprout shreds in there and eat that on top of barley instead of white rice. Okay, I have easily gotten to that eight grams and I've done so over the, the course of breakfast, lunch, dinner. If we snack on you know avocado slices or you incorporate more of those fruits and vegetables, it's very doable to get enough soluble fiber in day after day. It just might require a little bit of tweaking to maybe some of our current uh, meal and snack ideas. Like I said, I wanted to take a look at a nutrition facts label uh, before we ran out of time, just so that we kind of know where all of this information is at. Now, again, if you're purchasing an avocado, it's not going to come slapped with one of these. You can always look this information up online, or they have written and printed resources. Um, the Calorie King book is a very popular uh, reference to like find out, okay, how many calories, how many carbs, how much fat are in these things. But simply Googling avocado nutrition, you're going to get the USDA website showing up right there on the right hand side, and you're going to be able to see a full nutrition facts label. You can go straight to the USDA site and you can look up any food and it's going to give you all of this information. For any of your products that are coming out of packages, boxes, and bags, they legally have to include a nutrition facts label. Now, you're gonna see two on the page. The one on the left, we're phasing out this format, but I still see it here and there um, on different food manufacturer products. The label format on your right-hand side is the one that we are moving to. So we're gonna see that more and more often until that's the only format available. Now, you're gonna see those colored boxes. We've got orange, blue, yellow, green, and purple. Same information is included on both of these nutrition facts formats, they might just look a little different. Serving size at the top, this gives us context. Please, if you are trying to increase or let's say decrease your sodium content and you go straight to the sodium line, but you don't look at servings and you proceed to eat this entire package, that 160 would need to be multiplied by eight because there are eight servings in the package. So we always wanna start with serving size because it gives us context for all of the other numbers below. Fats are going to always be beneath calories. And the way that this works is we're gonna have total fats in bold with the number next to them. In both of these examples, it's eight grams. Like I had mentioned, the FDA requires saturated fat and trans fats to be line items. Now, in both of these examples, we can see that there's one gram of saturated fat and no trans fat. Well, people might ask, well, if there's eight grams of fat, why is only one listed? unsaturated fats, both mono and poly unsaturated fats do not have to be included, but it doesn't mean they aren't in the food. In these examples, one of the eight grams of fat are those saturated fats that we're trying to minimize. The remaining seven grams of missing fats would be coming from unsaturated fats. So when you look at a, a, a jar of natural peanut butter, that fat content is gonna be very high but the saturated and trans fat is very low, indicating that the majority of the fat that we're consuming are those good, heart-healthy, unsaturated fats that we're, we really wanna be maximizing. We go down two more lines. We've got that sodium. Again, another nutrient that has to be included. Anything that is 140 milligrams of sodium per serving or less is considered a low sodium food. So you might see low sodium uh, listed on the front of food packages. Reduced sodium is a percentage. So 33% reduced sodium. Great, what is it 33% less of? Because if we started at a thousand, we still are looking at a very high sodium product. So we always wanna make sure that we're double checking the actual nutrition facts and looking for that 160 milligram number, okay? Remembering that American Heart Association has us at 1500, and then the standard <clears throat> dietary guidelines have us at no more than 2,300. So by choosing a lot of low sodium products over the course of the day, if we can keep it at or around that 2,000, we're really minimizing risk for the, the negative you know, high blood pressure, that type of thing. Now, for those of us that are looking at those fibers and sugars, okay? 
Um, those are always going to be included under your total carb heading. Fiber and sugar always are going to be listed. One big difference to our new label format is that we get a little extra transparency. So you're going to see an extra line item there that says includes 10 grams of added sugars. This is how we can make sure that we are buying and consuming foods that minimize or don't have any added sugars in them. Okay. Now, you don't have to, in this example, those 10 grams of added sugars are included in the total sugars. So this tells me that two of the 12 sugars are naturally occurring. 10 of the 12 sugars were added by the food manufacturer. Okay. So if this is sweetened applesauce, well, regular applesauce is always going to be a source of sugar because it's apples, right? It's the added sugars that they're putting in there to sweeten it up that we really want to keep at as close to zero as possible, which I really think is a great additive to this new format is because it gives us as consumers this extra transparency into what is the food I'm buying, because it used to just be total sugars 12. Well, we didn't know what percentage of that was naturally occurring sugar and what was added. Now we get to see that, okay? Now, in terms of the fiber piece, sometimes a food label will include a breakdown of insoluble and soluble fibers, which is awesome. But know that the FDA does not require that legally, so it is far less often that we see that, all right? So that finding out that, that soluble fiber piece, you know, keep that um, chart handy that we included in this presentation, or simply look this stuff up. You can easily Google kind of the breakdowns of, okay, if a food has four grams of dietary fiber, let me go look this up and see how much of that is soluble, how much is insoluble. Generally speaking, if you increase your intake of overall dietary fiber and you do so through whole foods, those fruits, those vegetables, beans, nuts, flax seeds, you are likely going to be able to get your, uh, your daily solitary or soluble fiber needs met without having to know the specifics. You just got to increase fiber overall. And do know that research supports that increasing fiber through real foods, not supplements, has a bigger positive impact on gut health, on cholesterol, on all the things that we're talking about. So yes, taking a fiber supplement has its benefits, but eating more fiber through whole foods is going to be the best option.